So from those delivery shots to now, a lot of things have changed. The rest of the spray foam's in, trusses are painted, walls are almost all up, got a, a spot I've been avoiding. And cameraman Robbie is standing on concrete where there was dirt. So anyway, time to put these up. Uh, first thing, and it even says this in the installation instructions is, decide where to put your units. Now, my general um, concept here, both my units are gonna go on this wall because it's going to be protected from the sun pretty well. And I'm gonna have, um, well, they'll be sheltered well out of heavy wind. And on the opposite side of the barn is where I'm gonna do all my lumber storage, that's gonna be occupied. I don't want them on the ends for reasons. So they're both gonna go on this wall. Um, I'm gonna bring them in about 25% of the distance from each corner. So that way they're both responsible for cooling or blowing air in half the zone. And then we have three air filters out here um, in the open area, one in the middle and then one on each end. So the general airflow idea is I'll have one unit mounted pretty high up here. On the intake of those units, I'm gonna build some box filters a la J Bates style to filter air that, uh, to keep the units protected. But yeah, one unit on each side blowing air out this way and then the airflow will reverse and come back because I'll have an air filter on either side of the run blowing air back towards the unit because they're the intake and outtake. So I'll sort of have these long ovals of circulation on both sides. And so in the middle, air will be moving back. Over here, air moving that way. Farther over to the edge, air moving back. Hope that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, when I get everything installed, I'll go over that again. So that's my airflow idea. Um, obviously, I've already unboxed some of these, probably installed one of them first off camera, then um, after we make all the dumb mistakes, record the second one. Like I said, just skip the unboxing. If you're not familiar with boxes, box cutter normally does well. Cut any strapping, cut the tape, cut the cardboard if you have to, and they open. It's pretty simple. Uh, and if you're not familiar with boxes, installing an HVAC unit on your own, probably not a good move. So yesterday afternoon and this morning, we got the other unit up. Um, these are definitely not a DIY setup. I mean, they could be, it's not that complicated, but the instructions, not particularly helpful. But we made it through that one, even recording. I think this one might go quicker just now that we've got everything worked out. First thing to do is to pop this out. So. I definitely do not consider this a how-to installation guide. Most of my videos are not that kind of thing anyways. And if you want something fully DIY, there are other brands out there, Mr. Cool, that have um, pre-charged line sets and everything so you don't even have to pull a vacuum. I'll probably end up doing that on my own, which voids my warranty if I don't have a tech come do it. But yeah, just something to be aware of. Like going through the directions is clearly made for installers that just wanna look up information because there's like six models of these wall plates and they're all in the directions, but this one is not one of them and nowhere does it show like which model of wall plate actually matches which unit. And this is like one of many things just omitted that are not for people who don't do this for a living. So be aware of that. But if you're super handy, done a bunch of stuff, I've been able to figure it out. So, uh, you know, buyer's warning. Anyway, uh, one of the things I found handy was to screw in the center first. That way I can get it level, put in the other screws and yep, go from there. So, one of the reasons I did the three quarter inch rough sawn everywhere was just for stuff like this. When I want to hang it, I can screw things anywhere without worrying about hitting the stud and it was going to be perfectly secure. Next, I'm going to drill a hole for the line sets that are going to go outside. Um, you do want these to be at a slight downward angle so that way if there's any condensation, moisture, et cetera, stuffs, you know, it goes outside.
So when we did the last one, we hooked up the line side extension that goes from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit and then the, the line cover around that. And it was, it was tough. So this time, what I think we're gonna try to do is run the line set cover first and then add the line. That might go a little bit smoother. With the line set cover in place, we can hook up the line set extension. These caps um, are holding on the nitrogen in this. When they make these systems, they purge them with nitrogen to do a pressure test, make sure there are no leaks. So when I take these off, they're gonna hiss. That's normal, it's just nitrogen, not refrigerant, no big deal. Okay, so tightening these up to the torque specification, having to use a crow's foot on my torque wrench. Thing to remember with this is so long as your crow's foot is 90 degrees, you know, perpendicular to the shaft, then everything's good. If you're lengthening the shaft, you can get in trouble because you've just increased the amount of leverage and now your torque gauge is off because you're actually gonna be applying more torque than you think and you can over torque items, so always Make sure that you're uh, 90 degrees if you're gonna use this, or um, if you lengthen the shaft instead, that's totally cool. If that's your thing or just what you need to do to get into the right position, you just have to do the math to know what torque setting to use on your wrench. And whenever you're using finicky 90 degree brackets like this where there's not a nut to hold, just use a uh, adjustable wrench, spanner, whatever you wanna call it and get a good grip on that bracket because otherwise when you're torquing this thing, you can uh, break the valve or other components. So you don't want to do that. All right, I vacuum the lines, release a little bit of refrigerant, everything's holding pressure, don't have any leaks. Um, I'm just gonna walk you through that process because for the first time I've done this, so it was a ton of like instruction checking back and forth. Um, now that I know it worked, talk through what I did. So got everything torqued to the right specifications on the torque wrench. First thing I had to do was pull a vacuum through all the lines. All the refrigerant is in the compressor inside this unit. The lines um, have just air in it. Now the unit inside was pressure checked with nitrogen. So that's why they had those plugs. And earlier I talked about when I released it, you hear the hiss. That was all the nitrogen getting out, being replaced by regular air. And then these lines have regular air. If we push all the refrigerant on that air, there's a lot of moisture, some contaminants, as well as we'd be overpressurizing the system because there's more things in it than there are supposed to be. First thing to do is get all the air out of all the lines in the interior unit. Do that through the service port, a vacuum, and a manifold gauge. So hooked up the low pressure side to the low pressure side, vacuum to the service, turned on the vacuum, ran it for 15 minutes to pull all the air out of this. Now, if you watch um, other people doing this, a lot of times they'll use a core remover, removal tool to pull out the Schrader valve. The Schrader valve is that little pin looking dude that you see in bicycle tires, car tires, the one-way valve kind of thing that makes sure air doesn't come out. But as you push it in, then you can, then air will move. So I left it in because I don't have a core removal tool. The only difference between taking that Schrader valve in or out is how long it takes to pull a vacuum. You're still gonna be able to pull a vacuum. You'll be able to pull a full vacuum. It just might take a little bit longer, but I've only got 16 feet line sets, 32 feet. I've got a little pump anyways. Like I'd rather not spend $50 on a tool to make this job take half, I don't know, whatever. I'd rather just leave, let my vacuum run a little longer because I'd lose it after this job anyways. Um, so anyways, once I pulled the vacuum, let the pump run for 15 minutes, 
checked it, make sure it was there, turned it off and closed the valve and watched my valve. It did not move, let it sit for, probably ended up being about 30 minutes I let it sit, checked it, didn't move, so that means everything's good. Then the next test is I came up here to the high pressure side, turned that for five seconds to release just a little bit and then closed it and it, um, a little bit of refrigerant into the lines to take it from a full vacuum up to just a little bit more than atmospheric pressure which I see on this gauge. I've watched it and it has not moved. I said watch it for a minute. Um, I watched it for a solid minute and I've been checking it for about 10 minutes just to make double sure because I don't want to have to call someone to put refrigerant in. And it's holding pressure. So I'm ready to open both these valves all the way and let the refrigerant out of the compressor through all the lines through the interior unit and then it'll be fully charged. This is the one step um, that voids the warranty, so I don't have a warranty on this machine anymore because I did this instead of hiring a licensed HVAC tech to come do it. Um, that's a personal judgment call with your own experience of, you know, using vacuum pumps and gauges and working around pressurized systems. Um, one of the reasons I don't worry about it so much is even if this does have a bad compressor, warranties only cover parts and not labor. And from talking to quite a few people with mini splits who have had issues and made warranty claims, they normally end up buying a new unit because the labor to have them serviced, even with the free parts, is more expensive than these units. So, you know, if somehow I toasted the compressor or it just happened to get shipped to me bad and I paid someone $100 to come out and do this, and then they're like, oh, the compressor's bad and the company sends me a new compressor and it cost me $1,000 to get it put in. I'd be better off just spending eight hundred dollars or five hundred because it only needs the outdoor unit and just buy a new outdoor unit to put in. So um, that was why I decided to go ahead and just do this myself. Um, I was going to hire someone to come license and do it. The other reason you want to do someone license probably is if you're not confident in getting seals on everything, you do not want to be releasing refrigerant into the air. That's illegal. There's all kinds of issues. It's got to be captured and it's it's a headache. So um, if you don't want to DIY this kind of thing. Don't worry about it. Don't do it. No shame in hiring a pro. But anyways, yeah, time to release the rest of the refrigerant. Gonna disconnect everything first and then add some electricity. And we'll have heat and air, both fan, dehumidification, whatever we want. So just to test the unit, I ran some Romex, everything works. So that's good. We've got a little bit of a trench started because I think I'm gonna run this, well, I am gonna run this conduit underground. Just need to slap on my disconnect boxes. Code does require a disconnect um, beside any unit. So that way any service techs can just boom, make sure that it's disconnected if they need to service it, um, which I'm actually tying this into my meter panel that has a few breakers just because that, or breaker spots, just because that saves me punching any holes through the wall to have to pull conduit and put, you know, more bricks in, in my wall. So that actually worked out quite well. So it'll be really easy to flip a breaker here, but trying to stick with code, have my disconnects. So uh, yeah, we'll get these mounted, run all the conduit and start pulling some wire. I gotta get the knockouts done. Normally there's a spot weld on one side, so you just go to the other side and they pop right loose. And then if you, uh, your assistant doesn't forget the pliers, you can just wiggle it with the pliers and it pops out really easy. Um, but sometimes when they make them, they, the little spot weld doohickey isn't in the right place and they put too many spot welds on something and it's just locked in. Just get ready for a ride. For outdoor applications, if you're using conduit, um, make sure that you use the appropriate conduit. Normally for outdoors, you need to use stuff that's watertight. Um, unless you're fully enclosed, this isn't fully enclosed. Well, I guess if you're fully enclosed, you're not outdoors, are you? Anyway, um, so this is liquid tight and then use all the appropriate fittings. Uh, and if you're doing direct burial, not everything that's watertight is necessarily direct burial. So make sure it's safe for that. And I don't do this stuff a whole lot. So when I went to go pick up some tools, I figured out that they have these little special wrench dillies 
for the uh, nuts that go inside on, on conduit. This is so much easier than like hitting it with a flathead and destroying the thing, so. I love finding out when there's a better way to do stuff. She's have probably existed a long time, but um, everyone I grew up working with that uh, taught me how to do this stuff, they were all too cheap to buy things like this, so it's new to me. I bought these at different times and didn't realize that they were different colors, which I'm not too happy about, but anytime I run into stuff like this, um, as much as it bothers me, it gives me peace that I know there's people watching that are like just losing their minds way more irritated about it than I am and it all seems worth it. Everything's wired up. As you see, we have our disconnects. Just gotta plug this dude in and we're connected. We got our conduit going down, trench is all covered back in. So everything's protected. Got all of our seal tight, waterproof fittings on everything. Only thing left to do is to turn them on. And I realized something else about hooking them up um, out here to this panel instead of inside besides saving me knocking more holes in the walls and all that conduit headache, is when we do the electrical on the inside or if we ever have to work on the electrical on the inside, we can do that without having to turn off the heat and air, which will be really nice, which is making me think that when we do the electrical, I might wanna pull a temporary circuit through here to run the lights off of, so we can do the lights first and then have light, heat, and air while we do the rest of the work, and then I would just disconnect that circuit from out here and hook it to the panel on the inside, but anyway. Yeah. We're on. All right, got my special little helper. Everything's energized. Go, RJ. Yeah, hold it. Go turn on that one, bud. Hold it down for a second. One more time. Perfect. Can I get on the scaffold? Thank you. Sure. That's it, we have heat and air in the shop. I'm excited that I didn't have to drill any holes through the wall and that I can leave those turned on while we do the rest of the electrical in here. And yeah, that's it. I hope you learned something, were inspired or at least entertained. Uh, this was definitely not a how-to video, just my journey doing this. You know, buyer beware if you wanna do this yourself. Obviously the right answer is hiring a licensed professional. But anyway, until next time, make time to make something. Mm -hmm.